Good morning and um, welcome to this UK Film panel discussion at the Cannes Marché. Um, UK Film have four panel discussions lined up this week and this is the third. The previous two are available for catch up on the We Are UK Film website, so do please check them out. Um, there's another one scheduled for tomorrow about restarting production in the UK. Um, I'm Jess Loveland. I'm head of the BFI Network, which is the BFI's programme of support for new and emerging filmmakers. And over the next hour or so, we're going to be exploring the current landscape of online festivals and platforms and hopefully handing out some practical advice to help filmmakers navigate and make the most of the current current market for short films. Um, you'll be able to see that we have a Q&A box enabled on your Zoom screens. I have lots of questions lined up for the panel. Um, but if you have any questions that you'd like to ask throughout the course of the conversation, please do drop them in the Q&A box and we'll get round to as many as we can in the second half of this chat. I have four brilliant guests with me here today. Um, I'm going to go around and introduce you all. If you could give me like a little wave or do a, do a dance or something so that we know who you are, that would be brill. Um, first up, I've got my BFI Network colleague and founder of Bounce Cinema, Matt Ajan. Um, Bounce is an independent pop-up cinema showcasing the very best shorts and feature films and is committed to bringing different communities together to celebrate new and exciting stories whilst also supporting uh, new voices. Um, then we have US-based strategist, publicist and producer Kathleen McInnes. Kathleen runs See Through Films where she works to expand filmmaker networks, broaden and cultivate audiences and raise profile for both the films and filmmakers that she works with. And it's also some ungodly hour where Kathleen is at the minute in the US. So thank you so much for staying up to chat to us this morning. Um, Sydney Nater is also with us. He's a sales agent and president of SND Films, a boutique sales agency based in Amsterdam, selling award-winning live action and animated short films, TV movies and documentaries. And last, but by no means least, we have Rowan Woods with us. She is Film Programme Manager at the British Council, where she specialises in international festivals. Rowan also works as a programmer, a moderator, and an acquisitions consultant. So I thought, um, now I've introduced everybody, I'll just keep talking while I'll just hog the mic. Um, but then you won't have to hear from me too much during the rest of the panel discussion. Um, I thought I'd kick off by just explaining a little bit about what we've been doing at BFI Network over the last three months. So essentially, BFI Network is um, the BFI's new and emerging programme uh, for filmmakers. We uh, support filmmakers to make short films and develop their first features. And we also run a lot of professional development training and support. So. I think we were very quick actually um, in March and April to move a lot of our delivery online. So a lot of our regular events like short film screenings, script labs, filmmaker one-to-ones, we quite quickly built an online framework where we can de deliver those. We also set up uh, a new webinar series called BFI Network Live, which we've had a lot of fun um, developing and uh, using Zoom a lot over the last three months. We've had some um, great, uh, contributors, people like Ben Wheatley, Desiree Akavan, um, they've all been interviewed uh, for us and you can catch some of those now on the BFI um, YouTube channel. Uh, we're going to keep that going, we're having too much fun with it, so I think that's going to be a post-Covid um, operation as well. Um, we've ramped up all the content on our website, we're um, trying to feature as many new and emerging voices as possible, hear from all sorts of different filmmakers uh, and partners across the UK and internationally. And we set up a 90 second short film challenge with partners at Watershed, Depict and Encounters Film Festival. So um, right through April, May and the start of June, we were encouraging filmmakers to make 90 second short films in accordance with government guidance of social distancing and all of that. Um, and yeah, we've got a really great uh, archive now of brilliant films that have been shot during lockdown. We hope to feature those on the BFI player shortly. Um, I mean, that's a quick whistle stop tour of the sort of support we've been trying to offer to filmmakers during this time. But I wanted to start by um, asking Matt a little bit about how with his network hat on initially, initially 
how he's been working to provide continuity for filmmakers through BFI Network and Film London. Nice one, Jess. I feel like you gave the most amazing introductions as well. So sending you a virtual high five. That's but of right. course, at the moment, you know, it's, it's very special times for a lot of filmmakers and for the film industry in general. So I guess our objective at the BFI Network is how can we support filmmakers to increase their visibility and help get their work seen? But also alongside that, navigating the short film circuit can be challenging in itself. So we've been doing lots of webinars, teaching people how to distribute their work. And we had something recently with Jason Sunday from Short of the Week, which was really interesting. But the filmmakers, they've, you know, they've got a lot of questions. Is this the right time to be, to be releasing their short film? Should they be doing, releasing their work by themselves? And we've just been an ear really through the BFI network and helping filmmakers understand that it's important to know your intentions. What, what is your objective with your work? Um, who do you want to see your work? And of course, at the moment, because there's so many opportunities to go online, doesn't mean that right now is the best time. And it's just, you know, being an ear and providing our expertise to our filmmakers. So, yeah. And how, how have you been advising? Have you been, is it sort of a case by case basis? Is it looking at the filmmaker in the film and sort of judging it that way? I think definitely every filmmaker has a, you know, different ambitions. So again, it's what's important to the filmmaker. Do they want the first time their film is seen to be in a physical venue? And, you know, cinemas are apparently working towards reopening. So is there a massive rush? But from my perspective, I've just said to filmmakers, yes, apply to festivals. This is a perfect time to be reaching out to people because everyone's sat at home. So they're, they're more likely to be more responsive. But it's a jungle on the internet at the moment. So if you are going to release your, your work, be intentional. Make sure that it doesn't just get lost in the crowd. How can you yourself as the filmmaker be creative with your release strategy? What images do you have? Who, who do you have in your network that could amplify the work you're trying to release? So... If you are going to really sort your work online or your short, don't just rely on the festivals as well. Make sure you use, utilize your network and reach out to press and individuals. So that's the advice I've been sharing with our community. Yeah, that's really brilliant advice. Thanks, Matt. And with your other hat on, your bounce hat, um, could you tell us a bit about how, how you work with shorts and short filmmakers and develop audiences? Um, and maybe how that's changed in the past few months and any plans that you have in the future to support films and filmmakers throughout 2020? So it's, it's definitely been a special time for Bounce because we've seen our organisation as like, you know, cinema purists, the physical experience, it has to be offline. Everyone needs to be in that cinema. And we've done our first online activity. We've done a conversation with Ronaldo Marcus Green, who was the director of Top Boy and Monsters and Men. And it just really opened our eyes that ultimately it's a good thing. So many more people have access to content. So many people can access things they traditionally might not be able to access. Not everyone has the resources to go to major film festivals. So for us, it's been a big learning curve. And I think even for the industry itself, in terms of developing audiences, people engaging with organizations they might not traditionally engage with. So I think the work for us has remained the same at Bounce because ultimately we want people who might not think this might be for them in terms of short films or particular strands of independent cinema to think, okay, why not? Let me give it, let me give it a go. I don't need to leave the house. I'm sat at home in my boxes. I can just watch this and see if I like it. And then maybe next year, these might be you know, new audiences that will come to our physical activity. So overall, it's been a good thing. Yeah, you've seen it as an audience development exercise. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really interesting. Thank you, Matt. Um, moving on to Rowan, um, could you tell us a little bit about um, how British Council um, works with shorts? under normal circumstances um, and how you've had to adapt the ways you're working in response to changes uh, to festival delivery over the past year. Yeah, hi Jess. Um, it's really nice to be here. Um, so the British Council is the UK's um, cultural relations organisation and what we do, everything that we do is about trying to find opportunities for cultural exchange but also to um, get UK films and filmmakers in front of international audiences. So to that end, um, probably the main um, uh, our main program, our uh, most popular program, is the um, travel grants um, that we run in partnership with, with you guys at BFI Network, um, which is to provide travel funds to filmmakers who've been who've had their work selected at key international film festivals. Um, we've got about fifty or so film festivals that are that are our key film festivals. Um, that list can be found on our website. And so, if you get into one of those fifty film festivals, um, you can get a grant that's anything from. 
a couple of hundred quid for a local EU film festival to um, you know over a grand if you're going somewhere like Sundance that is a lot more a lot more expensive. Um, <clears throat> And this, um, this service isn't just for UK <clears throat> filmmakers, it's also for any films that are made in, in the UK. So, um, you know, if um, students have come, come uh, from, from abroad to, to, to study in the UK and are making their work here, they're also eligible for those, uh, for, for those schemes. Um, and then once you've, if, once you've gone through our shorts, our shorts travel scheme, you're automatically enrolled in our um, broader short support scheme so where we we have a um this sort of curated list of filmmakers that um we offer opportunities to and advice to on a year-round rolling rolling basis we also um have a similar scheme which is for labs so for filmmakers who've been selected at one of the key international labs you know torino sundance etc um uh and obviously at the moment our um our travel grants are on hold because travel is on hold um, but as so we're monitoring that situation really closely and as soon as travel starts up again we will open those th those travel grants um, for, for, for short filmmakers. The labs grant on the other hand um, that is still open because um, you know while the, sh the shorts travel grant is, is purely for travel the labs grant is a little bit more discretionary in how you spend it so it of course it can go towards your travel to attend a lab but it could also go towards subsistence or kind of course fees any you know anything like that and of course a lot of the international labs have shifted online so um, we are still providing that that, that support um, and information on both of those things can be found can be found on our website um, and of course you know the other ways that we support filmmakers um, you know we do a, a twice yearly shorts catalogue which goes out to a lot of international programmers at key international film festivals we have a, a database that we encourage every filmmaker to add their short to you know with a really nice image um, which again lots of programmers um, uh, and and finances tend to tend to use for for, for information and I suppose the other key way that we've shifted how we work is, um, you know, we appreciate that there are a lot of filmmakers out there who have, you know, questions and concerns about the festival circuit and, you know, not quite sure what's going on. Um, but also there's a need for kind of community and, and support in these in these times. And my colleagues have been running a series of um, online salons um, and that, you know, a moment where filmmakers can connect to each other and, and find that sense of community, but also get information on what's happening with those with those key film festivals. And as part of that offering, we've put together in partnership with our um, with our friends at BAFTA, we've put together a, um, a spreadsheet um, which lists all of the key film festivals that are coming up, you know, the key shorts film festivals that are coming up over the next sort of nine months, year or so. And it lists what is happening with that particular festival, you know, whether they've shifted online, whether they've shifted their dates, whether they've canceled outright, um, not many have. And that spreadsheet, I was hoping I could share it in the, in the chat, but we haven't got a chat function today, but that spreadsheet can be found on our British Council website if you go to the, um, the short section. That's, that's great and a really useful resource. I would encourage everybody to check that out because um, you guys are keeping that updated really regularly, aren't you, as you're talking yeah. to sort of different festivals. What, what are you noticing with the festivals this year? I mean, towards looking now, I think we're pretty clear on what's happening across the summer, but looking to some of the big autumn and winter, fe winter festivals, are they looking like they're going to be hybrid, online, in person? Can you make predictions? Is it just all too changeable at the minute? Honestly, it's still really hard to tell. Um, and I feel like I've been saying this to people for, you know, the last three months. Um, we just don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, apparently Venice is happening with, with red carpets and, you know, is, is going ahead in, in what looks like a real, uh, you know, a real live, relatively normal festival format. Um, but, you know, we still don't know what's happening with Toronto. They'd uh, announced a maybe a month or six six weeks ago that they were looking at various options you know one of which was it was a hybrid model um i know um you know new york film festival have also been looking at hybrid models um you know maybe looking for outside uh screening options 
but it's still it's still just too too soon to tell you know as you know this sort of situation has been evolving week by week and i think most festivals are leaving it until the last minute to wait until they have absolutely the most up to date local government guidelines as to as to what they can do and then of course there's a balance to be struck between actually what you what you can do what you're allowed to do and what makes sense financially um, because of course if you can only fill cinemas a third full you may find that it, it just doesn't make it's not viable to, to to run a festival in that in that form um, and of course it increasingly looks like there won't be any kind of international travel for for any of these um autumn autumn festivals you know even even as far as far as sundance um you know who who knows whether the us will still will will let you know people from the uk in um so it's it's slightly too it's still slightly too soon to to, to know really just keep checking on that document that's, yeah. that's what people need to do Bookmark it. Uh, thanks, Rowan. That's really useful. Um, so moving on to Kathleen. Um, could you talk a bit as well about how you work with shorts and your short filmmakers through uh, see through films and how you've had to adapt your your approach in 2020 and lots of panicked filmmakers, I, I imagine. I, absolutely. I mean, not absolutely panicked filmmakers. Absolutely. I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, so my what I do is really geared towards the filmmaker. So I work with emerging, so shorts, first and second features, uh, world cinema filmmakers, so everybody usually outside of America. And um, I really, the, mo the bulk of what we do and what I do is to help them merge their creative and business development on the film festival circuit. So if they're trying to use their short film, for example, or even their first or second feature, as a way to really profile and establish and determine their own voice, their own style, their own place within the industry that they can move forward from. That's what I help them do. So in a way, nothing's changed. I mean, I'm still doing that. I'm doing it with a lot more filmmakers. There's a lot of filmmakers out there who are like, okay, this is a time where I, I want some conversation or I need some help or let's work together. So there's just more right now. Um, you know, as everybody said, I think the key takeaways so far are community, first of all. Um, I just, in fact, started a, a private Facebook page for filmmakers only, literally called filmmakers only, just so I can start to like throw out some information to a bigger group at a time. Um, so community being super important, this audience development idea of how do we, how do we look at audience now? I think that filmmakers have, especially short filmmakers, have different needs at the moment for their films. And while you might not be able to look at it the same way we did four months ago, there are other things that can come from playing uh, in a festival right now, whether it's a hybrid or online. And so we talk about how those can, what the advantages are to doing that, how that can help your goals and expectations. And I think also to this idea of keeping an eye on the festivals and what's happening, you know, Toronto will announce today what they want to do with their festival. Um, I'm pretty sure from what I understand, it'll be a hybrid of sorts. Rowan's point's really well made. You know, As of right now, Europe's about to put the US on a no-fly list, uh, which we had stupidly already, oh, I'm sorry, no editorial, which we had also already done. Um, who knows when we will get to start to fly again? So now the question becomes, how can you make use of this experience knowing you're not going to be in person trying to connect with somebody. I actually think, especially for short filmmakers, I actually think there's some advantages this way. I actually do think that we can make that be uh, a bonus for them. And how are you broadly advising people? Are, are you, are you, is it a case by case basis? Um, like Matt was well, saying? Is it some... We do it, we do it, uh, or let's, I say we because I'm, I always think of, see through films as we, but for the most part, it's me. Um, but my process is to say, okay, what are your goals and expectations? What do you want the film to do for itself and for yourself? And then don't just look at this film, look at the next film as well, whatever your next film is gonna be. And then let's target where you can have those goals and expectations met in the best possible way. And then let's look at the film and that festival and how that programming goes and talk about whether or not that's a place 
where you are able to not only get the film in, but make the most use of it. So it's very targeted and it's very individual, but it also has some generalities about it that you know every filmmaker wants. Brilliant, thanks Kathy. That's really, really useful advice. Um, Sydney, moving on to you. Um, from the perspective of a sales agent, how have you found the landscape this year for festivals and platforms? Um, I was just thinking about things like the in-flight entertainment market, which I'm sure is pretty dead at the minute. Um, have have uh, markets like this closed off, but others emerged? What's, what's it looking like out there at the minute? Yes, hello everyone. Um, uh, yeah, I have to say the in-flight markets have been going down uh, massively. Well, it's not a, not a surprise, of course, because hardly anyone is flying and it's slowly starting again. However, um, I had some deals in uh, the beginning of this year and they were not cancelled completely. Uh, some of them were actually just postponed. I mean, you know, there they were deals that would start in May, for instance, and now they're uh, aiming for a start date in September or October or even later. So they're all co re relatively confident that uh, people are going to fly again. And, and you can see it here as well, tours are coming in again. So I think even though they're not allowed to come from the US, sorry, Kathleen, <laughs> um, we, uh, we see uh, tours coming in and out. And, um, and you know, so I think uh, you have to see this, uh, look at this crisis um, more or less in, um, in a different perspective than just, I mean, we're in it right now, but uh, if you see the 2008 crisis or, you know, there were crises in, 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 in um, uh, 1983 or in the 1980s, I should say, and then later and later, uh, every 10 years there's a crisis. But eventually we all um, manage and I think the film industry has also managed. I mean, this one is really bad because of the theaters that are, uh, not uh, hosting uh, more than uh, 30 uh, people right now, and they were closed, of course, be beforehand. Um, but uh, I see, uh, coming back to your question, is that, uh, you know, the online business, of course, is booming. Um, I've, I've had deals with Canopy uh, in the past years, and, of course, every three months uh, you get your statements uh, with uh, companies like that. And I have to say that uh, the last statement that I got was uh, in April, which had a tail end of uh, March when, when the lockdown started. And you could actually tell that people were watching a lot more uh, at home because there was, they couldn't do anything else. Um, so actually, um, I, I'm quite hopeful that, uh, you know, the, the income at the end of the year is going to be pretty much the same as before. But I'm not, uh, you know, I'm a sales agent, I sell shorts, um, and I do short docs and a few documentaries as well, but I'm not a, a theatrical distributor or, or a theatrical sales agent in, per se, which uh, is, uh, you know, it's a different company, it's a different kind of uh, work, and you deal with all these theatrical distribution companies. And I don't deal with those companies too much, a little bit here and there in Germany and in France. Um, but I think eventually um, the, the economy will land and, and it will get back to normal again. But we just have to go through it, I believe. Yeah, um, ride yeah. the wave. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So I'm not too pessimistic about it, actually. Um, you know, it's of course going to festivals is, is really fun and I've been doing it for 26 years or even more. And what I really miss is the, uh, is of course getting, you know, a, a bite or a drink over, over some, uh, conversation. Um, but the, what you don't get online, I mean, I don't get it so much is a buzz. There's no, uh, Kathleen can probably say more about that, but you know, it's all about, a buzz usually during a festival which film is uh, did you like and and you know there's and there's not not any spontaneous spontaneity uh, there and um that that's something that online cannot um uh fix in my opinion so that's really too bad uh, you know so i think we have to get back to normal again as soon as possible with or without a virus <laughs> hopefully without hopefully without yes, a virus yes, yes. <laughs> um so would you say that broadly the appetite for acquiring shorts right now is 
is increasing because of every because of people um, I wouldn't online? say that I mean that's a question I got 10 years ago as well or, or even 20 years ago with uh, with the inter when the internet booming um, I think it's been pretty much the same um, you know it's just an appetite for films in general you know especially when you're at home you want to be entertained and you want to watch something and uh, people usually don't are not able to, too much to find shorts um, you know we as a sales agent we uh, sell usually to um, uh, to you know we are business to business company so we sell to television or in flight or or other companies or educational but we decided two years ago um, uh, with other sales agents to have a, um, a YouTube channel called kiss kiss and we uh, we started with only a thousand subscribers, but and it's free for everyone, of course. Um, but now, in the last uh, forty, um, in the last uh, three months, we it has spiked a lot um, the numbers. So right now, we're at uh, one almost one hundred eighty thousand subscribers, which is a lot for a short film channel. And um, you know, we get a little bit of money out of it, not a lot, uh, depending on where you are in the world. You you know, you get. Uh, uh, money per click and uh, depending on how many ads there are on, uh, around your short as well but at least it's a short channel that is um, um, you know curated by us and uh, so there is quality there which is good and people we can tell that people love it apparently so um, uh, but other than that um, if you just flip on your television there is no way you can see shorts um, too much you know there's there's a few cable platforms uh, or cable channels that do it, but it's very, very limited. Um, and, um, you know, the public broadcasters don't broadcast so many shorts anymore, unfortunately. You know, VRT, the Belgian um, channel stopped doing it. The Dutch channels haven't been broadcasting shorts, international shorts, I should say. They, you know, they do their own national short thing, but they, they're not acquiring shorts because it's been taken over by the platforms like Vimeo and Short of the Week and, and us, YouTube and, you know, so many others. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that hasn't, um, that has changed a little bit, but we still do ac exclusive deals. I mean, it's probably going to be your next question, you know, with the, um, uh, there, that hasn't changed too much. I mean, we still sell to Canal Plus in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Poland. Uh, France is sort of over right now for international shorts. We, um, the lady who start who, used to work there well she's leaving on the first of july and it's not 100 percent sure yet but it looks like the international shorts are over at come up with friends which is really unfortunate and they were the, the ones that would buy a quite uh, exclusive rights for a year um and the same for a movie star in spain they buy still buy exclusive rights uh for television for pay tv but and so they don't want the film to be online but they cannot be so rigid right now. So they told us, you know, if we buy, buy a film, you can still have your film at a festival. And if they're online, which is happening all over Spain, of course, uh, and all over the world, we are okay with that. So um, they, that's good, actually. I mean, otherwise you would lose money and they wouldn't be able to buy any films anymore because most of the films are going to be online. Mm. And do you think things like Quibi are changing the landscape? I mean, it's very new. No, I don't think so. Well, I, I also heard there it's one of the lousiest uh, startups uh, so far. Um, but besides that, uh, I've seen their programming and it's not the kind of films that we are promoting and selling. You know, we usually, I mean, I don't tell people I have artistic films, but we have short films, not short series, for instance, but it's, um, you know, we usually have films with a, a beginning, middle and an end, um, well, not always, but we usually do. And it's not the kind of films that they are looking for, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I'm, you know, for us, it's not a, uh, a another platform that we can sell to, unfortunately. Would it be nice if they are, were opening up to our kinds of... Um, well, don't forget that it's a lot of work for them, for programmers, to find films that we are selling. Um, you know, that's why it was... In the old days, the public broadcasters were always happy to do it because they had the resources. You know, they had one shorts buyer and the only thing they were doing is, is finding short films uh, from all over the world. And, um, you know, so QB, I think they're mostly 
uh, producing and um, trying to find um, uh, another way of promoting short content and not short films like we are selling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. different content, essentially. Yeah, it's different kind of content. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thanks, everybody. So I think I've gone round to the houses now. So um, open it up into a more general conversation, if that's okay. I've got we've got some questions coming in, which is brilliant. I'll jump into the Q and A box in a minute. But um, just to warm us up, I've got a few. The big question we're getting asked a lot <laughs> is: um, Should people be holding their shorts back? waiting for 2021 and the hope that everything's going to return to normal we can enjoy this lovely festival buzz and environment and the serendipity of meeting people over a drink again um do you think we're going to get back to normal uh should people be waiting or should they be um you know getting their film out there getting it in front of audiences however they can and then thinking about their next film can i is it okay if i jump in go for it so i think that you have a lot of moving pieces, moving parts to that question that you have to answer. But in general, as you're making that evaluation, I think there's, I think it's important to remember a few things. There are various pipelines of product that are really close to getting jammed up. So you have the pipeline of product that was starting when the pandemic started that maybe played South by or maybe one or two of the early festivals and immediately stopped and pulled back. And you have another pipeline of product that we're about to go through the stages and be ready to come and hit the fall. Those are still going to hit in the fall. And then you have the ones that are suddenly hurriedly, hurriedly trying to get ready to go, trying to look at the calendar. So to wait for something when we have no answers, which we have no answers. So to wait for something to happen in 2021 and to hold your film back is a, is a risk. It can be a calculated risk, but it is definitely a risk with regards to how much other product is out there, how many, many other films you're now in competition with, what your sort of what your needs are for that film, what you need that film to do. And with, uh, I think Rowan was saying earlier, some of the festivals are waiting until the very last minute before they have to decide how they're going to go. And so if you haven't made your decision already as to whether or not you can take advantage of a potential online only screening. Um, I think that it, there's a little bit of danger in saying, I'll just wait until Sundance Berlin. I'll just wait until Cannes next year. You know, I don't necessarily think waiting is a good idea unless you're fully prepared to understand what those consequences might be for you in the film. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good advice. Does anybody else want to chime in on anything related to that? Yeah, I can say something. I, I don't think waiting is a, a pretty good idea either because, you know, you, first of all, you don't know what's happening next year. Um, things might go back to normal and then there will be maybe an overload of films. And then you are uh, competing with films that are actually uh, brand new. So the festivals only, always have a limited, uh, you know, amount of films that they actually, actually can show. And of course, they try to, to show the best films. But if there are too many films, um, your film might um, uh, not be selected. And that's a problem. And I think, you know, if your film is done uh, trying to find a sales agent or, or, or a publicist or um, uh, a festival distributor as soon as possible and try to work with them and don't put your film online right away. I think that's uh, a lot of people are eager to do that right now because all these festivals are also online. They think, yeah, they're doing, putting it online. Let's just uh, put this film online as well um, without a festival. But I don't think that's uh, a pretty good idea either. So um, can I can I just ask Sydney, are, when you're saying don't put yourself online. Is that because you think it's diminishing the sales opportunity for those films too much because you think they're not going to be able to have the market that they could have otherwise? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I meant. Uh, I wasn't clear about that. But um, yeah, if your film is online, uh, if it's a brand new film and it's online, that means you can literally not have any uh, premieres for any country in the world. And, um, but you know, but even, do you make a, do you make, I'm sorry, but do you make a distinction between online just as like they put that online themselves versus online at a festival where maybe they've geo-blocked the, the audience, for example? 
hot dogs. Yeah, for when, I, when I stay online, I actually uh, always have Vimeo and Short of the Week in, the, in my in the back of my head because those companies are lovely in terms of the, you know, they, they promote the films, et cetera, et cetera, but they're not able to geoprotect uh, your uh, film. So especially North American filmmakers, you know, they want to get it out there as soon as possible. Uh, and then uh, it becomes, it's a staff pick, uh, and then the whole world can see the film. And of course, first you have to know the title and, you know, you have to sort of, um, you know, go onto Vimeo and, and find the film because it's a staff pick. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem, I think. Uh, wait until it's a bit older and, and try to, um, uh, try to limit yourself a little bit, uh, hold back because, you know, it's, I, I know it can also, especially if it's an animation animator, you know, they can, it, it can bring you uh, some jobs, but wait, that's my advice. Um, but don't wait too long either because, you know, you have to sort of, uh, you know, trying to sell the film um, before you put it online. So, yeah, but it, it doesn't mean that you can't sell it anymore. That's, that's not, of course, uh, true. Uh, you know what the thing is that if you if you have a film on Vimeo and there is an SVOD uh, company that is interested in your film they would let's say they would normally pay fifteen hundred dollars or euros or, or two thousand then this you know the, your, the price of your film will be uh, less uh, after you already put it online because it's less exclusive um, and maybe fifteen hundred dollars is is not a lot but it's still money and especially but, short filmmakers need it. Jess, can I just do yeah, one more? Yeah, go for it. Conversation at all, but um, but I am uh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess I want to make a distinction too, because not all films are ready to dive into the market uh, right away, right? And so you've got other considerations. Sydney's point seems really well made with regards to how to evaluate the value of your film and whether or not that value is something that is a priority for you and in the market. But there are so many other things that you have to take into consideration too. So if your goals are an award circuit, if your goals are, um, look, I really need this to lead to another film and that has very different parameters, that statement has very different parameters depending on what country you're from or what you're trying to do. Those things may give you a different answer than Sydney's great advice at the sales level. So now I think one of the things that we have is stages. Like where are you with regards to what you want your film to do? How much have you thought about how you're gonna do that? And then where in that sort of future forecast are you finding the stages that can work the best for you for your film? And maybe sales come a little bit later. You have to be aware that you're gonna not be able to do some things in the beginning so it doesn't affect that which i guess comes down to consequences being aware of the consequences of all of your actions now with regards to what your goals are later if that makes sense yeah it feels like filmmakers now more than ever have to be really strategic in terms of uh, it, it's the yeah. perfect word i mean honestly i think if you don't want to become a ghost film if you don't want to lose all of that i think strategic is the key word I'm very biased. I mean, that's what I do. I'm a strategic, you know, consultant, publicist person. So of course I'm very biased, but I think that's key. Try to take a minute and think about what you want to do, what you have to do it with, i.e. what kind of film you have and where you're going to have the best return on that. Um, just as a practical matter, I used to advise everybody submit your films early, pay the least amount in submission fees. I don't believe in waivers. Uh, I now say wait until the last minute because you're not likely to get a refund on any submission fee at this stage. So, you know, figure out what you want, wait till the last minute to do, and then submit your film then, which is costly, which is, you know, there's a, like I said, there's a consequence to every action. So it's all these little things that start to build up, I think. Yeah. It's expensive, but at least you're not losing the money potentially yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah and, and it goes back to i think what matt said which is intentional be intentional be yeah. intentional in everything that you want to do and it's great it was great advice from matt i thought yeah i want to pull matt in again now because i've got a question about the sorts of we, we've talked a lot about and matt spoke specifically about missing that theatrical experience being in the room mm -hmm. together we've all talked about 
how much we enjoy festivals and the opportunity to just meet people, bump into people, share a drink, talk about the films. And that's happened. It's still happening, but it's harder. Um, so I want to spin it, make it a bit more optimistic now, Matt. What advantages do you think online festivals offer for short filmmakers? I think the main advantage is there's no cap in terms of capacity. So, you know, you have a venue, maybe only 300 people can show up, 200 people, 100. And when you go to festivals, not every venue is full up to the brim. So now, if you're doing an online activity, depending on a Zoom account or whatever you're doing, there's no cap. A thousand people, two thousand, a hundred thousand people can see a film. And also, again, access. Previously, you know, we see in the industry, there's a lot of stuff that is London centric. Now anyone can come and watch your, your film. Or if you want to do some extra activity at the end, like a Q&A, you can be in Paris, you can be in Nigeria, you can be in Jamaica. Everyone can tune in. Of course, you know, different time zones are going to impact things. But I just feel like it's a great opportunity to actually broaden your horizons and think about where you're targeting your marketing. You don't have to just target your marketing to your community. You can get a bit more creative. So I think that's, that's the beauty of it, access. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, and it feels more democratic for filmmakers to actually attend film festivals. It's cheaper. Oh. You don't have to travel. You don't have to pay all the expensive accommodation costs, um, that kind of thing. Um, Rowan, um, do you think that the hybrid festival is here to stay? Do you think that there are sufficient advantages to some of the models that we're seeing that it might, like most festivals might have some sort of online offer in the future? You know what, I, I kind of do. Um, I mean, of course, it's it's really hard to say at, the, at this stage, um, but I think, you know, to go back to Matt's point about, um, about accessibility, you know, um, I think festivals are realizing that you can be far more accessible. Um, and also, you know, we're all waking up to um, the climate emergency and, you know, realizing that perhaps flying all around the world to festivals isn't necessarily um, viable. Um, so I think, I think increasingly festivals will, will try and look at, look at ways of making themselves more accessible. I do think that fundamentally, you know, to your point earlier, that being at a festival in person and those, you know, those moments for kind of serendipitous meetings and, you know, being part of that of that of that sort of vibe and the whole festival experience is sort of fundamental to that festival circuit. So I think, you know, as far as possible, every festival will be clamoring to go back to, to, to some kind of normal model. But I wouldn't be at all surprised if there is, you know, as we've all kind of become uh, accustomed to using Zoom so much and realizing, well, why did I ever go to someone else's office for a meeting? Mm -hmm. um, increasingly festivals will be thinking, oh, actually, maybe there are sort of cheaper ways or more accessible ways of uh, expanding our, our program and, um, you know, reaching reaching wider, wider audiences. Um, but I think, you know, each, each festival will decide for themselves on, on what works and what doesn't. But, you know, also, I guess there will be a question of, of cost, you know, a festival like Toronto, it was just announced yesterday, have laid off quite quite a few staff and you know there will be a lot of festivals that are in um, a difficult financial situation after this year having not been able to run as as usual and there may be ways of you know they will be needing to look at ways that they can perhaps um, run on slightly more economical um, models for the coming for the coming couple of years so I think it will be really interesting to see but I, but I do think the idea of um, taking some of the learnings from the, from this moment and and adapting as we move forward um, feels, feels exciting. Brilliant, thank you. I'm going to jump into some of the Q&A, uh, the questions coming in through the Q&A box because we've got quite a few in there now and there's some, some really good ones. Um, we've got one here from Kate Separovich who's asking um, Kathleen and Sydney what they think are the major opportunities for shorts at the moment. Sydney, or do you want to yes. go first? We are, okay. we, I, can, I can say something. Um, it's, um, it, it hasn't changed so much in the, you know, in the, like in the last 10 years. It's, it's still 
uh, the, well, I would say the platforms that what, what's recently been uh, really good for us is, uh, I think I mentioned that before, is uh, the educational uh, sales actually all around the world. Um, because, you know, colleges, universities, they all need materials and they don't always buy feature or our docs. I mean, that was the original Originally, they always bought those films, but for uh, for the last couple of years, uh, the short, doc, not just short docs, but short live action, short animation, um, um, they work really well for um, for the educational sales. So uh, that's one of the best things. So go with a good platform um, or company in the world. And uh, I work with Canopy, but there are others as well. Um, and they do public libraries uh, too, which is also going uh, more international now. Um, so that's really good. I mean, I used to say in-flight, but I can't say that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, you know, the theatrical sales were always pretty good too. Um, if, you know, I work with Interfilm and Kurzfilm Agentur in Germany, for instance, and they always do a really good job in the German-speaking territories. Um, you know, per film you get between, let's say, 200 to 600 uh, euros a year, uh, depending on the film, of course. But the film needs to be short, like five, up to five, six minutes. You, can, you can't have shorts that are too long for, because they're preceding a feature, usually. So, um, you know, the question is, it depends on the short as well, where it goes to. The, so you can say, where does my short sell? You know, you need to know what the short is like, if it's a short doc or if it's animation, if it's long, if it's short, short, short. You know, some of the longer shorts over 30 minutes, they usually don't sell very well. But if it's LGBT, for instance, then you have a whole different area where you can go to. Um, and that's what I've been doing as well. I mean, a, a niche market is usually good for a short film. Like, and animation is, uh, it sounds weird, but it's also a niche within the short film industry. Uh, and so is LGBT, horror, all these genres are a bit of a niche, but it works and it's pretty clear. And I think from my position, I come slightly before sales. And I think the opportunities are exactly, as Sydney was saying, the opportunities are still there and they look similar, but the tools with which you use to take advantage of them have changed. So um, social media becomes super important. If you're trying to capture an audience and retain that audience and keep that audience to follow you because that audience is no longer necessarily wedded to a festival. Um, you need your social media platform so that you can do that, to be quite honest, or a, a web page at the very least, but social media is better. Um, and I think that really truly targeting exactly what you want, and this is something that's hard for short filmmakers in particular because nobody really guides them in this direction from the very beginning, but targeting what you want and what you want out of the experience also means understanding what you're going to do next and what you want to have happen. Where do you want to work? Who do you want to be talking to? Why do you think you want to be talking to that particular industry? What's the, what's the, what's the ask, let's say? Um, all of these things, again, it goes back to that word that Matt used, intentional, but it, it really is that the possibilities are still there. It's just the tools with which you access them have changed and really the hard work has to be done by the filmmaker now. There's, there's no magic carpet anymore. Yeah. Well, look, there hasn't been a magic carpet for a long time, but <laughs> let, let's forget about that. And that's interesting what you're saying about social media. Do you think that, um, I think that's really important at the minute, sort of building your profile uh, as, a, as, a, as a marketing tool. You're marketing yourself as much as your film at the minute oh where gosh, you yes. can't go out and meet people. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So look, it's, this is the first go-to. So one thing that's happening is a lot of the industry are getting sort of online festival weary already. And, and I will plead guilty to that myself. Um, but one of the things that we do as a matter of course, is we look at who you are when you're reaching out to us. And the first thing that we go to, it's a Facebook or Instagram for the most part, Twitter is sort of second stage. Um, we're looking for that visual representation of who you are. It is a tool. It becomes a uh, very much a, a part of your presentation as much as your CV or your resume or your film. And you can use it as such. It's a beautiful tool for that. As much as we hate Facebook and we hate other things for other reasons, this can be a tool that you design that works to your best advantage, that creates the brand for you, that defines um, sort of what your goals and expectations are in a way that work really well with the cinema, cinematic language that you create when you make your work. 
So I, I'm a big, big social media fan for sure. Great. Thank you. That fills me with dread. Social media terrifies me. Um, I have a question here from Chris Hees. Hi, Chris. Thanks for tuning in. Um, he's asking about pre-sales for shorts and um, pre-sales can be a, a core part of financing features. He says, do you think there's a hunger for shorts to start doing the same? Anybody want to chime in on that? You mean pre-sales like a, like we would on a feature where the, the financing helps to make the film. I, I have to admit that I've had limited experience, although there's a group in Cannes of all places uh, that's doing something like that. And there are various other smaller groups that I know about. Um, I don't know that that's a big part of anybody's world right now. Sydney, do you know about pre-sales? No, I mean, yeah, it's very, um, no, I don't, well, I, I have no experience in that, I should say, or I heard anyone do it, trying to do it. Um, I know if you want to, you know, within, we're in the Benelux here, so we help each other a little bit. And so with the Dutch Film Fund, you can get, um, you know, funding from uh, from Belgium, from the Belgian Fund as well. Um, but I wouldn't say that's a pre-sale, that's a pre-finance, or that's financed by, by the two funds. And that happens with CNC as well. If you have a, you know, in France, that's also a funding body. So if you have a French uh, production company, uh, especially with animation, it works to do these co-productions as well. But, mm. but I think, not that, a pre, not, not I think a pre. on features, it's, it's, it's quite standard. strong. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah, well, yeah. it's not only standard, I think it's actually become quite strong. So um, a lot of people on features will find sales agents uh, strategic publicists like me, we all want to get in earlier and earlier and earlier. And some of those people who want to get in earlier in the process, like I come in on development in a number of projects. Um, some of us can bring money to the table. So that kind of co-producer kind of pre-sale maybe is something that can be, that you'll see a lot more right now. For shorts, I don't think so though. Oh, well, I shouldn't say I don't think so, I just don't know. I think he's mentioning here, I think he's has an example of a film that he's produced, a short that he's produced that got support from a sales company early on, based on a, on a previous short film that the filmmaker had, had made. And I think that he's saying they came on during final stages of development and uh, mm -hmm. managed to secure a pre-sale in France for them. So yeah, it's unusual, isn't it? But yeah, it doesn't sound and, and I think special. Mm. Uh, but I think it heralds something. So everybody, mm. I think he's actually on the cutting edge, so to speak. Everybody wants to get something that nobody else has gotten yet. And if you have proof of the pudding, so to speak, by, by virtue of having an earlier short that did really well, or you have already proved your, your pathway to audience is huge because you, you, your films speak to the human condition that way and you can go global, then a lot of people are going to want to be interested in jumping onto the next one as soon as possible. And if that's now trickled down to shorts, I get it. I get it. I don't think it's going to be big yet because the market's going to, it's going to be a hard market to bear at that point. Mm -hmm. But I understand the urge for people to want to get in and get that film and be identified with that film as fast as possible. Look, it all comes down to profile, right? Mm -hmm. We all, we're all trying to drive our filmmakers to high, the highest profile for their benefit, but also for ours. You know, we're not, it's not, we're not altruistic that way. No. Um, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, just having a look through some of these questions that have come in. Um, we've got one here about whether sales of short films are possible without a strong festival presence first. Maybe one for you, Sydney. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was reading something. Oh, <laughs> I was, sorry. Yeah, I was <laughs> reading Audio Clinet who yeah. was saying that there are TV pre-sales in France. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just called you out there. Mark, yes. Mark, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's about sales of short films and whether they're possible without um, a strong festival presence first. So if people are maybe... Oh, not, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've had many examples of films that, are, that didn't run at festivals at all. Mm -hmm or slack or a little bit and they were selling really well it really depends on the film so you don't have to go to festivals all the time i mean of course it helps if you get a big award 
but not all buyers are interested in uh, a big award. They, you know, if the film is good um, for them, then they buy it and they don't care about the awards. I mean, of course, they all, sometimes they ask for it, but I have examples of these very, very tiny little shorts that are two, three minutes long. They don't win huge awards or they don't play at too many festivals and they sell really well because it fits the buyer's uh, needs. So. Mm -hmm. It's it's not of course it doesn't mean that you shouldn't go to festivals and shouldn't uh, you know uh, uh, get them uh, in in there um, or even uh, shouldn't get awards but it's great to get awards and get money for it as well by the way and uh, recognition um, but it doesn't mean that you can sell your film if the film hasn't been at the festival. That's Good. the short answer. That's the short answer. That that's really mm -hmm. helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe one for the panel generally. Um, are you going to more festivals at the minute because you're not physically going because you're just logging logging on to them? <laughs> yeah, right now there is um, uh, all these festivals are suddenly happening at the same time, like Cannes Film Festival, NSC, um, which other one was happening, Palm Springs. So it was too much, I think. It was all happening in one week and you can't keep up with them. And you're, yeah. you know, I, a friend of mine said, we're not jet lagged anymore, but we're Zoom lagged. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's a bit of a, an issue right now. Uh, you know, when you're physically at a festival, it seems like your brain works differently. You're focused and you're concentrated uh, and you know what you're doing. But if you're just sitting in front of your screen, like we're all sitting now, um, you know, you don't have distractions besides doing the laundry, but um, you're not completely focused, uh, I noticed. But maybe yeah. it's only me. No, you know, just to build on that, there's just, there's so much to pick from. Yeah. And I think sometimes you can schedule so many things and you just realize, wow, just, I just missed that. But from my own personal experience, I haven't been going to more online festivals, but I might just see something floating on social media, click on it and jump in. And it's just individuals setting up their own things. So I feel like it's not more about the festival, just more about the programming. If there's something interesting enough, then I think people will show up. So it just comes down to great programming and how people are selling the activities they're doing. Yeah. I personally find it harder to carve out the time. As Sydney says, you know, if you go to a festival in person, you know you're there for three days, five days, and you can really immerse yourself in it. But when I'm trying to juggle it alongside my various other commitments and my various other jobs, um, you know, I always think, oh, I'll go and watch something maybe later, or maybe tomorrow. Um, so I'm finding it harder to really um, get myself in the, in the zone and focus on it. I, I feel the same way. I think it's a zone thing for sure. And it's easier to be in the zone when we're physically at those festivals. Um, and I think that the idea of uh, programming, like what Matt was saying, programming and curating really becomes more and more and more important as, as we try to make these decisions and make these choices. And how the festival presents, like the, it's exactly, I have the same problem that Sydney has, which is Palm Springs, Annecy and Cannes all at the same time. And trying to, first of all, how easy it is, is it going to be for me to get in somewhere? Uh, and I love that Matt says he looks on social media and is able to jump in. I haven't been able to jump as easily as he is. I need to <laughs> figure that out. <laughs> but Thank you. I'm going to do it. I'm going to send you a note after this and go, how did you jump? <laughs> but, but it is. It has, how easy did the festival make it for you? How, how simple was it? Um, and then you prioritize. But if I see strong programming and curating, or I know strong programming and curating, I might choose that first, you know? I Absolutely. I, th I think, as you say, for me, something has to feel really unmissable in a way that if you're there in person, perhaps the bar is slightly lower and you're more willing to take, to take risks on a filmmaker that you don't know or yeah. a film that, you know, could, could be interesting. Whereas when I'm at home, um, I find I can only really carve out the time for something if it really, really feels like an absolute must, must see. Mm -hmm. That's the, yeah, everything's changed so quickly in just a few months. I feel um, we're running out of time and I feel like we've only just really sort of, sort of broken the surface of this. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now. Thank you all for all your amazing questions. Thank you for tuning in and staying with us. Thanks to all the brilliant panellists. Um, I believe that this recording is going to be made available and archived later on the We Are UK Film website. So um share it with your friends <laughs> um if it's been useful to you um there are 
other sessions available throughout today. There's one immediately after this, you'll have to be quick, called Branding Yourself and Your Projects, which is um, presented by Yave that could be really useful for short filmmakers. And then um, I'd encourage you just to dig into the online program of talks at the Marche here over the next few days. Um, so thank you to all my lovely panelists. Thanks ever so much for your time this morning and all your insights. And it's going to be interesting watching how um, the festival world uh, develops and how filmmakers navigate it and the impact long term. So thank you. Thanks ever so much. Thank you, Jess, for your you, amazing Jess. moderating. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.